people just loved Gilead because they were like, oh, Gilead. They're can't. the saviors. They were the saviors. And, and, and you know, there were all of the issues about, well, do the drugs, do the companies want to get involved with HIV or not? And, you know, and, and the crazy thing, too, is if you go to any, you know, big gay events or anything, they're always a big sponsor. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and they want everybody to be patting them on the back and saying, you know, they're, you know, exactly, they're, they're the savior, they're our friend, they're, and, and how can you turn on us and yeah. sue us? But what nobody knew was that that really they were not our friends yeah. ever. Um, they were just trying to make as much money as possible and didn't care. Prioritizing profit. Prioritizing prioritizing pro- Dangerous drug and product cases. Welcome back. Another week, another episode of Prioritizing Profits, Dangerous Drug and Product Cases. Uh, we got a busy show today, jam-packed. <laughs> We do, we do. How uh, how are you feeling? How was your weekend? All good, all good. Um, yeah, actually, it was a good weekend. Um, last week it was really crazy cold down in Sonoida. This weekend it was gorgeous. Mm. Uh, got in two great hikes um, Saturday and Sunday, so nice long ones with nice weather. Um, the dogs. How's, how's the uh, three hundred and sixty-five hikes a year doing? Okay, well, it wasn't three hundred and sixty-five. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere how around was there. It? It was, oh, 52 hikes. So it would be one. You got me thrown off there for a minute. That would be like every day, which would be interesting and nice, I guess, but uh, not very realistic. Um, No, so it was the 52 hike thing. And I kind of gave up on that being happening in 2023. I don't know what quite what number we got to. It was in the 30s. Um, But between some really crazy weather in the summer and then going into a hip injury, um, we, we kind of got off track. So well, go into the new year. Here you go. You got a clean slate. Well, yeah. And actually, and we've hiked a lot this year already, but I think instead of counting them and having some kind of outside pressure for a, a number or a goal, I'm just going to go with hiking, um, for the fun of it. Um, uh, we'll... that's overrated. <laughs> you gotta make it a competition. You gotta try to <laughs> one up people. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll reconsider, but uh, I don't know. I have to go back and count up. But uh, but we're doing great, actually. We're ahead of, if, if, if we were doing it starting January 1st, we'd be, be ahead for sure. Ahead per week. That's yeah. good. That's good. Um, my weekend was pretty solid as well. We had a dinner party on Saturday. At your place? No, it was at Christina's old roommates, Kendall and Lauren. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, Great people. Been uh, good friends with them. I think uh, when me and Christina started dating, they were living together already. Um, And then they lived together for, I think, about three years. And uh, they got me into wine drinking. They didn't really drink wine. You know, I was Mm -hmm. uh, just not a big fan of it. And then, you know, they would always just hang out on the couch, watch TV, drink wine, and talk. And, you know, I naturally started participating in these activities <laughs> and became a big wine fan. Rubbed so, off on you, huh? Yeah. Um, good friends with them. And they invited us over for a dinner party where, you know, I guess you, you show you, you, you dress up and they cook. And then, oh. you know, you bring some wine and you hang out and you talk. Maybe you watch some TV, listen to music, whatever it is. Um, anyways, it was a fantastic time. And I felt very adult. I was like, wow, this is, this is what adults do for fun. Like this is how <laughs> this is how adults spend time together and like hang out and have a reason to 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 be together. So well, you are an adult. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am an adult. Technically, Te- technically, sometimes I forget that. Yeah, um, I forget. I know what you mean, though. I mean, yeah, very. Yeah, I mean, I think you just realize like the past times and what you do when you're younger, and then there's it. It almost feels like a pretty hard cut off of when those activities either you just stop doing them or they're not as enjoyable or those opportunities aren't as available. And then new ones arise because like dinner parties a year, two years ago, I would have been like, what the fuck is that? (laughs) You know, I'm sure it'd be fun either way. Yeah. Rather than going out. Yeah. So good weekend. So isn't, isn't Kendall the um, friend that's in law school? Yes. Uh, Yes. Okay. And we were supposed to get her down to Sonoida for wine tasting. So we may have to get that back on the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, 
they're not the best at planning whenever <laughs> whenever I or like Christina will say she's going to hang out with them or for example like the dinner party I'm like you know a week before oh what time you know what time should I should I start and then even a few days before I'm like oh we're doing this in the morning what time should I you know start getting ready or like tell this person that I gotta be gone by and she's like man you know that we won't know until the day of like that's just what we do we just don't really figure these things out until moments before and I think that's absolutely insane. I don't understand how anyone can live like that. But well, that's especially just what... not having people come over to your house. So you, you expect the house is going to be ready. All the food's going to be yeah. ready to be cooked and and organized. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be last minute about that kind of thing either. But. Yeah. So I think planning. I mean, planning a week in advance clearly is a is a, a tall task. So asking <laughs> for well, we, well, you could plan a week in advance, just not have all the details. Yeah. Yeah. But or you could have the details. She just doesn't need. Oh, to see, you. and that's the thing. That's where I mean, that, Christina. You know, everyone has very defined roles in their relationship, and one of Christina's defined roles is she's the planner. She she figures out what we do and when we do it and all that, and then I I come along and I'm the good time. I bring the good vibes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I guess I should arrange this all with Christina. Yeah, like. she is definitely the uh, point of contact there. All right, well, we'll get it on the calendar because there's a, there's a couple uh, and some one really fancy new one that you guys have not been to. A winery. Yeah, yeah, oh. it's called Los Milix, and it actually, I mean, it's real Wine. modern architecture and really fancy with food and everything. It looks like something you'd see in like Sonoma or Napa. Mm. Um, definitely not what you normally see in, in Sonoma. A winery of my people, it sounds like Los... Los, Los Milix. Milix, oh, yeah. 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 It sounds Mexican. Yeah, it's not Mexican. I'm trying to think. Um, I think maybe Argentina. I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, close uh, enough. Anyway, we'll get, it checked <laughs> out. we'll get it checked out one of these days for sure. Anyways, let's uh, let's hop on hop into it. Updates. Okay. Well, I have a big update on the HIV uh, medication lawsuit. And we talked a little ways back about the fact that um, the, the defendants had tried to file a motion to dismiss, basically kick the case out and say, there's simply, this, there's no such claim. You can't file a lawsuit saying we had, they, you had a better drug and you didn't use it. That's not a claim. Mm -hmm. There's no defect in the actual drug. And unless there's a defective drug, you don't have a products liability case. So um, the judge said no, denied the motion to dismiss. The case was moving forward, but of course they appealed. So it went to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals um, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, um, and it was a, a really strong, strong decision. Really? Well, and I, I do want to kind of go over this for anyone that might have forgotten or not be familiar, because this is like one of, I think, one of the most interesting cases we've discussed, and one of my favorite, because when I uh, talk about, you know, what you do with mass torts and uh, product liability and whatnot, um, and be, people may not know what's going on, or they're like, "Oh, what's that like? What's an interesting case?" Mm -hmm. This is a great example yeah, where yeah. there was an there's um, an HIV AIDS medication company released that medication, and what it was a year or two after they had actually come up with a better medication that worked better and uh, reduced a lot of the side effects, a lot exactly. of the really harmful side effects that the first one did. But their patent on the first one still had a few years going on it. Quite a few, yeah. Quite a few years going on it. And so instead of essentially competing with themselves and releasing a second drug that's better than the first one, they decided to leave this first one out until the patent fully ran out. They squeezed as much money out of that <laughs> as possible. And then when that pat patent ran out, they said, oh, what do you know? We actually have a second drug that is much better than this one. So any of these other competitors that might be doing off-brand, cheaper versions versions of the first drug, you don't even want those because we got a second one that's better, works better, and has less side effects. Wow, you really summed that up beautifully. I'm, I'm quite <laughs> impressed. And that was a, quite a few weeks ago, too. Yeah, like I said, it was one of my favorites. In it. Yeah. And, and I've definitely told a few of my friends that because I think it's it really does hit home for a lot of people. And I think it opens their eyes to just how slimy some of this stuff can be on the back end and profit oriented profit prioritizing prioritizing profits, profits. There we go. yes yeah. yes we like that terminology <laughs> yeah uh, these companies can be yeah well exactly and so and if anybody wants to hear the full explanation where we really we really talked it out that was episode 26 wow. where we really focked on you know so it's been a while, <laughs> top right? of your head too <laughs> well not top of my head i did write that down on my notes <laughs> I checked back because I would I did want to refer to it because we really got into the the you know into the deep end on that and 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 got into real details about just 
you know, the, the timing and how nefarious the whole thing really was. Yeah. So definitely, if, if this is a topic you're interested in, go back to episode 26. Um, but the update on this, you know, um, it, you know, I mean, not only is did the, did the court say that there's a claim, but they actually used the term morally blameworthy. Wow. Yeah. So what they said is they said, we conclude that negligence in a decision that deprives people of a safer drug and leaves them reliant on a more dangerous drug is morally blameworthy. Wow. So what, I mean, I think the word of like morality in in law is like, that's kind of a finicky thing. That's a very, so subjective, right? And so for a court to use that term, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, this is an amazing, amazing and really powerful and strong decision. Um, you know, and that, that, that's kind of their, you know, opining on, on, on just kind of the extremity of it. But, it, but, you know, one of the really important things is just the fact that they, they were, they were addressing what legal duty does a manufacturer have and what legal duties do they not have? Because yeah. they were saying, we don't have a duty. This isn't, this isn't a thing. This isn't law. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, know? I mean, and, well, and they're not wrong, right? There isn't a law that specifically says you have to release things in a certain way or certain order or anything like that. Well, right. I mean, and nothing would ever be that specific, but what it does talk about is what is appropriate, what, what involves exercising reasonable care, yeah. what, you know, is negligent, which falls below the standard of care that you would expect of a manufacturer of a medication. Mm -hmm. So again, what exactly does that mean? And that's what where what, where the courts come in mm -hmm. and 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 define some of that. Um, and so you know the, they talked about saying that well the question that they had to address was whether a drug manufacturer having what it invented what it knows as a safer and at least equally effective alternative to a prescription drug that's currently selling and that is not shown to be defective has a duty of reasonable care to users of the current drug when making decisions about the commercialization of the alternative drug. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, laid it out there saying, okay, the drug that's out there isn't defective in the sense that it does do what we say it's going to do. Yes, it has horrible side effects, but hey, we warn about those. Yeah. So we don't, you don't have a lawsuit against us for the side effects because, fair. you know, we, we explained, here's the positives and there are some negatives. You get to choose. Mm -hmm. They choose, okay, I don't want to die of AIDS. I take the drug. I take the side effects. Mm -hmm. but, um, but do they have a duty if they know they have a better drug right in their back pocket yeah. that wouldn't cause these side effects? Yeah. And they said, nope. We don't. And so the court is saying here, um, you know, the, and again, all of the facts hadn't been, have not been laid out. I mean, the case hasn't been tried, but they tried to just kick it out saying that there is no such claim. Yeah. And the court's saying, yes, there may well be such a claim. And if this is what's happening, mm -hmm. if what they're alleging is what actually happened, mm -hmm. again, you know, we haven't had all the testimony, um, but this would be morally blameworthy. So, I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that's strong. And they they get really specific in there too, where it says like, it doesn't even have to be a better drug. It has to be, you know, reasonably equal with its effect effectiveness. Um, and then, you know, if it has less, of, less harmful side effects, this is a pretty big decision, not only in this specific case, but I would imagine moving forward as well as this will be a case that if anything similar to this even comes up, it will be referenced because I don't think this yeah. is a situation that has never happened before, right? Oh like, yeah, they just <laughs> maybe didn't get caught exactly, like lots of times. Exactly. A lot of these things probably happen, but we don't find out about yeah. it. Because the, the the rule of patents with, I think it's seven years, right? Seven years they're able before... Well, actually, I think it's 20, 20 or 50. Yeah, but yeah, shoot, I bet I will we'll double check that. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, that that's something that pharmaceutical companies live and die by. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, they want to make the, the, the money the exclusive, you know, the yeah. exclusivity. I mean, that's when you get the big bucks, when there's nobody else can compete with you. Overcharge the shit out of it. Oh, my gosh. So I would not be surprised if there's been other situations behind closed doors oh, yeah. similar to this, where, you know, they have a, a drug that works fine, and they're very open about it. But then they find something even better, maybe a few years, one or two before the patent runs out, or maybe like right Right, like in this situation, pretty close after the first one was released. Um, so in those situations, this is a case that can be referenced back and say there is claim here, there is validity to us pursuing it, and at least getting this in front of a jury. Yeah, and now, and this is in California, and so it's this was California state law. And and the other thing too is that as exciting as this is, and believe me, people are celebrating. <laughs> I mean, it's a big, big deal. Yeah. But of course, their 
are going to appeal and it's going to go to the California Supreme Court. Mm. So um, hopefully, you know, the same thing, you know, one more step, hopefully it will go one more step. So, you know, they're going to keep fighting it. I mean, it's a big deal. And like you said, it has implications for, you know, far reaching implications for drug manufacturers. Um, And, 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 and I think it would be a great ruling. And I think what should put drug manufacturers on notice that this isn't okay, and you're not going to get away with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is shocking and and really goes to the title of our show, Prioritizing Profits, where just knowingly um, sacrificing the well-being of of your patients and the people using your drug for profits. Yeah, yeah. Well, big uh, stuff. Big stuff. (laughs) Um, Definitely recommend people to go check out that previous episode. What was it? 26, right? 26, yeah. 26, if you're interested in going into a little bit of a deeper dive there. And I think we also have some documents, I'm sure, that they can check out on the website. Oh, absolutely. We have a page there. You know, and just to kind of go back, I mean, the the injuries that um, it's the difference between TDF and TAF, and that basically they're both forms of this medication, tenofovir. again, uh, manufactured by Gilead. But the injuries that we're talking about are kidney damage and uh, bone loss, bone damage. So osteoporosis, osteopenia, tooth loss. Um, again, some pretty significant injuries, um, but we just hadn't, hadn't mentioned this in this segment. So if, if you or somebody that you know um, have, or, you know, what were on these medications and have those problems, you can still make a claim. Again, it, the litigation is looking very favorable. This was really the biggest issue. I, I mean, I can recall being at the conferences when they were first talking about um, getting involved, you know, the, the pursuing this litigation and, and attorneys were deciding whether or not they wanted to get involved in it. And I can remember people saying, ah, I don't like that. I don't like it. Just, it, I, that's not, it's not a claim. I don't see that happening. There's no law that says you can't do that. Uh-huh. Um, but it, of course there were a group of people who felt very strongly that, well, yeah. maybe the law doesn't say you can't, but maybe it should. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and if somebody doesn't stand up and fight this and push to change the law or to clarify the law, um, you know, then, then companies will get away with this. They'll keep doing it. And, and I mean, this is a prime example because literally everybody who had HIV was put on this Gilead medication. I mean, this was a novel new medication. It wasn't something where there were all kinds of options. Yeah. And so, you know, and again, you're talking about a, a disease that was fatal at the time. I mean, it's very treatable and survivable and, and, and actually almost curable at this point. You can get it down to where you don't even detect it. But at the time, it was like a life or death thing. Yeah. So, okay, I might lose my teeth. I might have osteoporosis. Fine. You know, I might have some kidney damage, bring it on if I'm going to live. Yeah, I'm not dead. You know, I mean, um, so, 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 so there, wa- you know, there wasn't a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting here too, hearing about the perspective of some of the attorneys kind of leading up to whether or not this was going to be pursued because there isn't any laws against it, but it's a situation where no matter what perspective or where you're at you, and you look at this and I think anyone can say, okay, this is wrong. Like this doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't pass the sniff test, yeah. right? It just smells stinky. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's just not oh, and, and it, cringy, right? Exactly. Like maybe there isn't like a line in, in, in a law that specifically they're breaking. But, you know, like you said, someone has to do something about this. This is clearly wrong. And we know people agree with us. We know it, it just, you know, whatever side it's wrong and, and someone has to do something about it. And um, luckily, you know, that's attorneys stepping up and, and bringing this to, to light. Yeah. Well, and I felt very strongly about it from the very beginning. Um, and, and this was back, this was pre-COVID when, when we were first, um, you know, just kind of getting involved in this. Um, and there was, we, we actually had a booth at the AIDS walk here in town. Um, and we were talking to a lot of um, people and, you know, and they hadn't heard, they didn't, you know, nobody knew about this. They just knew that the doctors were now saying, hey, this is a better drug. I'm going to yeah. switch you over to this. I mean, and again, exactly what Gilead wanted, go off of our old drug and go onto our new drug that now we, ha- you know, we have, have exclusivity for going into the future. And they had no idea that, you know, that, that these symptoms and problems that they were having that they could have avoided mm-hmm. or, you know, I mean, and so, so, so just talking to people, I mean, they were shocked. Um, and, it, and it's kind of, you know, you know, it's also interesting because Gilead has gotten, you know, they, it was a small company before this. I mean, this is like their blockbuster right drug. Now. It's what made the difference, you yeah. know, and I think we also got into some details on that back in that other episode. Um, but people, 
just loved Gilead because they were like, oh, Gilead. They're the saviors. They were the saviors. And, and, and you know, there were all of the issues about, well, do the drugs, do the companies want to get involved with HIV or not? And, you know, and, and the crazy thing, too, is if you go to any, you know, big gay events or anything, they're always a big sponsor. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and they want everybody to be patting them on the back and saying, you know, they're, you know, exactly, they're, they're the savior, they're our friend, they're, and, and how can you turn on us and yeah. sue us? But what nobody knew was that, that really they were not our friends yeah. ever. Um, they were just trying to make as much money as possible and didn't care. And, and I think we had talked about, too, in another episode that there were quotes from people saying, well, well who cares? They're going to die anyway about, you know, by the time they got developed, by the time they got diagnosed or started experiencing symptoms of the bone loss or kidney failure, you know, the disease potentially would have progressed and, and would have killed them. You know, so just some really extreme, hateful, awful, offensive things, yeah. um, you know, from this company that's trying to say it's like the, the big, you know, uh, benefactor, mm-hmm. you know, friend of the gay community. Yeah, not so much. Yeah, that's going to be an interesting narrative swap and, and mm. change up here yeah. when, when it comes to, especially in these situations and these type of cases, because there are a few cases like this where there is a super, certain demographic or a group of individuals that are affected more than others. I think so, one of the first comes to my head is the hair relaxers exactly. ones, right? Yeah, yeah. And and that was most uh, most commonly African American women that were using it whenever you know they were going out to the office, whatever it was, mm-hmm. they were, it was they were using it mostly. And in this situation, it's the gay community community um, where they are the most affected and they're the ones, like you said, Gilead is kind of reaching out to, creating these connections with, trying to um, create this savior narrative where like we're here to help, mm-hmm. but uh, behind closed doors, that's not really the case. And, it, and it's going to be interesting just seeing how the community reacts to this as it comes out because yeah, as it, it gets more public. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, and we'll definitely touch on this again in the future. So I'm looking forward to that. What uh, what else do you got for us? So actually, I had a. <laughs> we we oftentimes talk about recalls, but we haven't really had a section of recalls. And I was like, you know, we should probably just address, you know, if there are things that yeah. come up. Um, and there is a current ongoing um, recall from um, the Quaker uh, from Quaker Oats products, um, and it's actually it's a bunch of their products, 67 um, in all, and it includes granola bars, cereals, and various snack foods. Uh, and the issue is that. Um, they are contaminated with salmonella. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And salmonella is kind of a, you know, you hear about it a lot, and there are a lot of different types of products um, that get recalled over salmonella. And, it, and it's not it's not necessarily fatal, but it, it, it causes about 420 deaths annually in the United States. Um, but, and, and, but, but like young people, elderly people, people with um, immune uh, compromised immune systems um, can be very susceptible and and it can be fatal. Most people um, just get sick. Mm -hmm. But again, you could get very seriously ill with this. So it's not something to um, to ignore. Yeah, well, with Quaker too, I mean, that is a household name. Like, ev- I think everyone can go into their cabinets and find something that <laughs> I know has I did. <laughs> Quaker, yeah. Um, and, and especially with their granola bars, like I know growing up in elementary school and going to middle school and whatnot, that's kind of like the snack that you get. Especially yeah. if you're in sports too, and you you know yeah. halftime at a soccer game, nice easy snack that will give you some energy, give you some carbs to keep on going for the second half. That's a granola bar from Quaker Oats, and yeah. um, and like you said, it the, the the younger audience and and the olders are the ones that are going to be a little bit more uh, susceptible to the extreme extremities of this one. So. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and it kind of has that, that healthy feel to it too. Yeah, it's it like, does, it's it not does. just like a candy bar, you know, no, it's like, yeah. bigger, oh, it's like oats and sound, sound very healthy. And, and certainly they can be, although to be honest, most of these products have a shit ton of sugar in them. Yeah. So question how, how so, healthy that is. But. So how does it work in this situation? Because that's pretty shocking that that many of their products are being recalled because that seems like just about everything across the board. So it must've been literally a salmonella and the oats that they use in all their products. Well, actually, the, 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 there's a list, and you can go to their website to see the exact products. Um, some of the ones that are involved are Quaker Chewy Granola Bars, Gatorade Protein the Bars. Bass, the Chewies. Yeah, the Chewies. Captain Crunch Bars, 
Quaker Simply Granola Cereals. Um, there's 67 of them. And if you go to their website, it's QuakerRecallUSA.com. There'll be an entire list. I actually went on the list because I have some Quaker oats um, in my pantry. Um, and I use them for like uh, with these little protein balls we do or, yeah. you know, oatmeal and that sort of thing. Um, and that and the, the plain Quaker oatmeal is not listed i'm not oh, still not sure if i'm going to use it or not but <laughs> yeah i mean that's <laughs> so a pretty far. heavy hit to their brand as well when it's yeah. that many being recalled for something like salmonella it, it, that's you know parents don't want to hear that and no once no. you have that thought in your head that like wow they things can go to shit across the board for a company like this you know <laughs> why do you want to risk it well and they've so far they've they, there's no indication as to how this contamination happened yeah um but they have admitted that it has happened and and these are the products that they know that are involved um so definitely check your pantries um and and, and keep an eye out for symptoms um s- symptoms that usually that people will see will be fever nausea vomiting abdominal pain diarrhea mm-hmm. Um, Sounds like a day to day. <laughs> well, hopefully, it's not a day to day. The thing about this too is that symptoms can uh, can begin anywhere from six hours to six days later. Jesus, right? So if you're having this kind of these kinds of symptoms, um, you know it may well be related. But definitely, you know, go to your pantries now. Check out what you've got. Um, if it's one of those products, um, you they, you can get reimbursed on the website. Mm-hmm. There's a whole process that they will. Well, I mean, that's something that's like what I get a chewy box a box of chewy granola bars. That's like six bucks. But I'm gonna be ill for the next like week or two weeks. You know, like I don't want my six bucks back. I want my two weeks back. That's all right. Well, you could also make a claim for your two weeks. But uh, (laughs) you know, there was a while back. Actually, it was I think um, Skippy peanut butter. Um, what was recalled. And I bought that quite often because they have a no sugar added version. And, mm-hmm. and Jif sometimes has that, but it's, for some reason it was easier to find the Skippy. And so I buy these like big, huge things because I use them also for dog treats. So like the frozen things I make for the kiddos, yeah. um, that involves a banana, and, but all, the, all unsweetened, unsweetened applesauce, unsweetened peanut butter and banana. And of course, like when I make their birthday cakes, I know people are thinking I'm crazy, but yes, I make all these things for my dog. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Um, But so, and and actually for people too, I mean, we don't need all that extra sugar. Um, So I had, and I would buy, I'd go to Fry's and I'd get like a couple of those huge 64 ounce things. And when it was recalled, I did have a couple of those. Um, And so I did, they actually sent me coupons and they sent me a whole handful of coupons for like free products. So, I mean, by the time they got back on the shelves, I had free peanut butter for like a good six months or something. Yeah. Um, but but that's a wise thing for them to do too, because I think what happens sometimes is when, you know, products get recalled, you, you, you go and you switch to another product. Yeah, yeah. And then you don't switch back. But if you have coupons and you it's like, coupons. well, I'm not going to give up this free, you know, free products here. <laughs> right. And then you get back. And I mean, the, the power of habit and, and just it's buying. brand loyalty. Brand loyalty is insane. Insane. And, and I recognize it and I, you know, you see it in every day. Like, for example, with cars, Mercedes Benz, like, no matter matter if I was a multi-billion dollar, you know, insanely rich, I wouldn't be buying. <laughs> you will be, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. I wouldn't be buying Lamborghinis or anything like that. I'd be oh, buying man. the best of the best Mercedes Benz. You know, like I, I think, um, and it goes to clothing too, is that people like to go to their stores. They know what they like. And that when um, you think of peanut butter that you're going to get, you have your brand in your head that you know you, you prefer. Yeah, it's, it's it's weird how 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 we we uh, get in those ruts. Don't, isn't so, it? what what is the next step for a company like Quaker Oats f- going forward here? Because you said that they don't know how that contamination happened. Um, are they just going to keep on going and say, you know, well, I guess we just slipped up. I hope it doesn't Well, no. Anymore. I mean, so so their factories will be inspected. And I mean, ultimately, I'm sure they will f- figure out what happened, where, you know, uh, where this all came from. Um, but at this point, they have not indicated anything along those lines. Um, and, and again, it's a huge company. I doubt that this is going to be their major downfall. A lot of companies have had to recall certain Most people products. don't even find out about these recalls, too. Well, that's true, too. And, and real. The reality is most people won't get sick, but 
you know, it's better safe than sorry. And especially if you have young children, elderly people, or people whose immune systems are compromised, you know, just you don't want to take that risk because it can be deadly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if it's not deadly, it can make you miserable for quite a while. So, um, you know, so, so that's, you know, one of the, the, one of the, the reasons we talk about these recalls. Yeah. I, I'm glad that we're going to hopefully add a section in. I'm, I mean, hopefully there isn't recalls every week, but <laughs> if there is a recall, we'll definitely mention it because that's something that I just, I mean, who, no one really goes and thinks about their everyday items in their pantry or, um, for example, I think it was the, the blender or toaster or something a while back. Yeah, air fryer. Air fryer. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, you go. I mean, you, you just use the products. You don't think about it, and you're yeah. not going to do research about any potential recalls. Well, you know, and, and there are recalls every day, and there are multiple recalls every day. But that being said, so many times it's like they're recalled for undeclared allergens. Like, oh, there might be some nuts in here, or there might be some dairy, and it's not listed on the ingredient list. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about those. Um, but the ones that can really be, you know, very dangerous. In fact, we remember we were talking about, like, the frozen fruit and people had died. Yeah. Was, yeah, that was, um, I think it was another, was it E. coli Trader Joe's, or, yeah. Trader Joe's, the strawberries. Right, right. And there were some other fruit blends, but it was, um, uh, you know, and they figured out where that had come from. And I think it was some particular um, supplier in Mexico. Baja, I, California. Or, I yeah, maybe, it, okay, it might have been. Um, but, but anyway, and, and, and again, that one was something where, um, a lot of people could be affected and, and it can't, I mean, again, this can be very serious. And of course the things like the, the child beds and those kinds yeah. of things, I mean, we're always going to talk about those that are, you know, that can, um, you know, can result in well, serious injury or death. Well, and it sucks too, for the situations like the, the frozen fruits, the strawberries, the Quaker oats, or the products that you feel healthy eating, that you don't <laughs> think there's going to be anything wrong. And then not only kill you. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you find out, wow. Well, there's actually some terrible side effects because there was an issue in development. I know. And if you were just eating ho-hos and ding-dongs, you'd be fine. <laughs> I haven't heard of a single <laughs> Twinkie recall. Okay. Never. I know those things. <laughs> I mean, what do you know? <laughs> and they like last forever, right? Don't they like, I don't know, it'll be some nuclear war and it'll be cockroaches and Twinkies will be around and yeah. that'll be about it. Yeah. I always wonder if that's true, but uh, hopefully we won't <laughs> have to find hopefully out. Hopefully we don't there. have to test that, yeah. that theory. Uh, cases that we're handling. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about Zantac and we have, we've discussed Zantac previously, um, but this is a case that's still going on. There have been settlements, um, and there, but there are still cases and cases that are scheduled for trial next month in February. And the, uh, towards, uh, I guess the end of last year, some analysts were saying that they were expecting that, that, and it's GlaxoSmithKline is the manufacturer, that GSK would be settling all of the cases um, in the first quarter of 2024. Wow. So here we are. We're in the first quarter of 24, yeah. so we're here to remind you, time is of the essence. Yeah. Um, you know, these cases, they have already settled cases. I mean, again, this is one. Of, this is a recall. Mm -hmm. um, all of these medications were recalled in 2020, um, taken off of the shelves because um, they, they contained um, what has been determined to be a carcinogen. Um, the active ingredient is ranitidine. Um, and that can can degrade over time to form a chemical called NDMA, and that not the good. That's What's, MDMA. Oh, okay. This is yeah. NDMA. One letter from being a good time <laughs> or death. I don't know. Either one could be. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so in, we know that it's a carcinogen. People have come down with a variety of cancers as a result of using this. Again, they've pulled the product. They know that this uh, carcinogen is in the product and that it cause, can cause these cancers, and they're settling the cases. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then this goes, this is like a lot of the different cases, any of the cancer cases that we've talked about, people don't, people take a medication and they may develop the cancer years and years later. And so they don't link it up and they don't realize. And so the only way that people know is if they listen to our podcast or, you know, there are, are certainly a lot of advertisements yeah. and that sort of thing. Although I haven't seen any that recently mm -hmm. um, because a huge a huge uh, percentage of them did get settled. Um, but again, if you took a Zantac medication, it was over the counter, um, you know, you could buy it at any drugstore. If you did take that um, and you have been diagnosed, um, well, the, the primary cancers that are involved in this are bladder cancer, gastric or stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, um, and pancreatic cancer. Jeez. So those are the primary cancers that are very directly related. Yeah. Um, there are some other cancers as well. If you, um, 
you know, have a different cancer and took, a, you know, took uh, Zantac um, or one of the generic forms of it regularly, definitely get in touch with you to get mm-hmm. in touch with us. We can let you know if that um, is a case that you can pursue or not. But we're expecting, um, you know, some settlements coming up pretty soon. Yeah. I mean, crazy that that, that this situation is unfolding because that was an over-accounted drug. I remember taking oh, it. It was for, yeah. you know, what was it? Heartburn and kind of like Acid stuff. reflux. Acid yeah, reflux. Yeah. Acid, I, yeah. I, I took that like not all the time, but I definitely took it a good amount of times when I was younger. Um, and then from one day to the next, the, the aisles were just clean. You couldn't yeah. get it anywhere. Um, and to find out that now that over-the-counter drug that anyone could buy is or causing or is causing cancer is insane. Um, and, and, and in these situations, because you did touch on how it it can take several years for cancers to develop or to, to, you know, catch on, uh, but sometimes it can take even longer, right? I mean, that can take seven, eight, nine, ten years, even longer than that. Um, even though they're trying to settle all the cases in this quarter, if someone develops a cancer, you know, nine or 10 years down the line, uh, but they are able to make some type of connection there. They still have a case, right? Yeah, you would still have a case, um, but it would put it would it would be an individual case. It's unlikely that it would be combined into you know you'd be able to resolve it in a global settlement. So you'd actually have to prove your individual case yeah. as opposed to go through um, you know a process like this where you're basically submitting a claim. You don't have to. Uh, you may have to file the lawsuit, or I mean we would do that, but um, you you don't have to give depositions. You don't have to go to trial, nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this is a much uh, more efficient, streamlined process. Um, and a lot of times, too, people will say, I'm just not up, especially if they're suffering from some form of cancer or, or serious illness. I don't want the whole thing of a, of a lawsuit. I don't want to have to be deposed. I, I, no, no, that does not sound good to me. I just don't want to do it. Yeah. And this this process, you know, in all likelihood, you would never have to do that. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so if you have been diagnosed with one of these cancers, absolutely, it's time to talk to an attorney to get your case, um, you know, get your case submitted. Um, but if if you know you get diagnosed in in you know future years again, still get in touch with an attorney, um, and and you know we would go through and explain what that process would look like. Yeah, I, I, I see the perspective of someone that is already struggling with cancer, right? Like, I can't even imagine the physical and mental, emotional yeah. toll that that would take. And sometimes you just don't want to add anything else on no, your plate. Yeah, and, just... and so this is a situation which, you know, Thank goodness that sounds like the company is, is coming forward and kind of owning up to this and trying to make this process as quick and as easy as possible for all of the victims. Um, but this isn't a situation where it's going to be drawn out for a very long time. They are, you know, at the table in discussions. Oh, which... yeah. Well, and, and, and they, they really need to get it settled. The estimate or the, uh, you know, kind of the guesstimate they were saying um, was probably about $5 billion, um, mm-hmm. for this this next settlement in the first quarter this and, year. And how does, how does a drug like Xantan that has a carcinogenic even get in uh, into circulation? Is this going back to the FDA kind of like, oh, if it's similar enough to this drug, stamp of approval? Well, I think that in, on this one, um, the actual active ingredient, this um, ranitidine, um, is not itself a carcinogen, but that, that, that it degrades over time. And so they didn't know initially. Uh, And so, you know, it was, I don't think that there's any evidence that they knew about this, you know, until the the process kind of started. And and, I mean, did they know sooner than they let on? Probably. (laughs) Uh, It seems (laughs) a little bit more modest than some of these other companies that just straight up release drugs that they know have some of these harmful effects in them. Yeah. Uh, well, so if anyone does have an, uh, any of the cancers on that list, definitely recommend reaching out because this is another situation where you just wouldn't imagine there being a connection here. Like maybe with the stomach, um, I, like I could kind of see that making that connection, but with like the pancreas, esophageal, the esophageal, yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. I, I think some of those, you your first thought wouldn't be an over-the-counter drug, but if right. you do have any of those cancers, definitely reach out and, and we can do the necessary due diligence for that. Absolutely.
Uh, interesting cases in the news. I see we got a few on the list today. We do have a, a few, <laughs> and we'll get to your favorite in just a minute. But <laughs> but the, the the kind of the, one of the hot topics that I've seen a lot on social media and in the news is you know this whole uh, Boeing seven thirty seven Max nine blowout. Uh, this case where the plane took off and then this mid cabin panel um, basically just blew off, and it um, apparently had to do with a a plug. Um, that was supposed to hold this door. Um, and anyway, so the door blows off mid-flight. Um, I think they were at about thirteen or 16,000 feet. Um, pretty terrifying. Um, they were able to land the plane safely, but um, the Boeing CEO came out and basically said that this was our fault. Um, the plug was not properly secured to the fuselage, either during the manufacturer or otherwise, while the aircraft was being built by Boeing. So they've pretty much admitted, hey, you know, we messed up. We shit the sheets, guys. <laughs> yeah, you're saying sorry shit the about sheets. That. So they pretty much have come out and said that. Um, and there has been a lawsuit filed by um, several of the passengers for the trauma, um, physical and emotional injuries that they sustained as a result of this situation, um, which, you know, if, you, if you've read about some of the things, people were texting, you know, their mother, their family, oh, yeah. and they thought they were dying. Of course, yeah. I mean, this was, this was it. And I mean, and that can be very scarring, I would imagine. Um, I don't know that I could get back on a plane after that. I mean, that could be really life changing. Well, you're, you're kind of looking like maybe you could. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you can't really um, put yourself in a situation like yeah. that. But um, that obviously is a terrifying thing. I think the biggest thing would be not being able to get on an airplane. Like that is so limiting, right? I mean, uh, yeah. you, you you have family across the country, across the world, even in a few states away. Like those possibilities just aren't really uh, there for you anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, I would imagine that you're having, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of symptoms. You could have anxiety, but I mean, loss of sleep, I mean, anxiety attacks. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, again, I just... Um, I was after 9-11, I just couldn't get on a plane for a while. And I mean, I wasn't anywhere close to any of that. Yeah. Um, but just that the sheer idea of it. And then the, the, just that reality. I mean, you kept hearing over and over all of the stories of how, you know, these people basically knew that they were dying mm -hmm. and all of the messages they sent. Yeah, um, actually, kind of on this topic a little bit off it is I saw that there was a Netflix documentary or like a show reenactment, essentially, based on a true story. I didn't know that a lot of the families that f suffered losses from the World Trade Center, there was a government payout there, wasn't there? Yeah. I and know. it was in order to avoid lawsuits for the government. Um, I don't I don't necessarily think we should get into that too much, but I think that's really interesting. And I, it's something I never imagined that the government would be able to be sued for a terrorist attack like that. Yeah. And I don't know a lot about that either. So I wouldn't, I mean, without doing some research, would not be really able to speak too much to that. Um, I mean, that's quite a bit different, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, any, any, in, you know, in any of these cases, you look at um, comparative fault um, is the government. I mean, in, in, in any bad actor kind of case, mm -hmm. um, you know, say like a, a drunk driving accident, for yeah, example, you, you have a bar. criminal, well, you have a criminal um, element to it. And so how much of the fault is the drunk driver, how much of the fault is the bar that yeah, allowed the sense. drunk driver, which kind of goes to like the government and maybe the government didn't do enough to prevent the terrorists. Safety restrictions. So exactly. Uh, and okay. so in that sort of situation, there would be some percentage, um, you know, allocated to, to the government or the bar and, you know, either situation. That makes sense. Well, getting back onto the topic, uh, this happening to a Boeing, especially because Boeing, I feel like is kind of like the golden child when it comes to airplanes, right? Like Boeing's are the airplane. That's what everyone uses. That's what I think when people think of airplane brands, they think of Boeing. I can't think of any other one. Um, <laughs> so to see that this happen to a Boeing, them take responsibility. And it sounds like they don't actually know at what stage of the process of manufacturing the, the plane, this kind of hiccup or this oversight happened that right. led to this catastrophic event, which right. is even more scary because now, you know, there's a ton of Boeings out in service or all across the country, all across the world. Right. Well, and this is specifically 
directly to to the Max Nine, and so they grounded all of the planes and they did some initial inspection. And this is still under investigation by the FAA and, and Boeing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found several others that also had these loose wow. plugs. Um, so it did look like it was a problem with multiple. Luckily, it didn't happen at a point where yeah. they couldn't turn around, and you know there were no fatalities. Oh my God, imagine if you're like across over, over the overseas. ocean or something. Oh my yeah. God, what even? <laughs> What do you do? That's crazy. I didn't even imagine that. It's really crazy. But I mean, all this, you know, the, of course, the, it was depressurized and, you know, the, the masks drop and all of that kind of drama that you see in movies. And um, and these people, you know, lived through this. Um, and so, so <clears throat> immediately afterwards, Boeing refunded the cost of the airfare and gave every, I know you're, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice. well, and gave everybody $1,500 um, initially. They, they said that it was, quote, as an immediate gesture of care, um, which, you know, and again, they, I, I think that they realize they're on the hook for more than that. Um, That's but, something that you can just do right away. You don't need to go through all of these, like... Yeah, you can kind of, like, look a little bit better. And, you yeah. know, and maybe for... And again, if you file a lawsuit, it's going to take a long time, you know, but maybe you need to get into get some counseling. Yeah. You need some medication. I mean, whatever you might need, yeah. um, you know, you have a little bit of cash there to, to get started It, it, it on is that. good. It is good. I mean, and it's... I, you know, I just am imagining, like... You know, you requesting a refund after this, and they're like, "Ah, oh, no refund, sorry." <laughs> <laughs> Even though it is good that they did it, it's just kind of pretty funny. bad press. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ooh, you know what? We we will half we will refund half because we got you halfway to your destination. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, anyway, so um, there's going to be some big lawsuits coming out here. Is this something where it is a class action where everyone on the plane is going to be piled together? To certain well, extent? so the, the, a few have filed um, initially, and they're saying that they are trying that, you know, again, we don't know, the judge would have to, uh, you know, certify it yeah. as a class action, but they're saying that they want to represent everybody on the plane. Um, yeah. And in this kind of situation, it that very well could make sense because again, you know, People, I, I, I would not downplay the emotional injuries at all because I can't. I would just be traumatized. Yeah, I, sure. I guarantee you, I would be tra- hor- horrendously traumatized. Um, but there were, were no fatalities. Um, there were no major physical injuries. So the damages, um, it's not like you know they've got multiple different wrongful death yeah. cases where you have to look at what was the earnings of this person, it's not very how many family members. So right. So the the injuries are more similar yeah. um, amongst all of the passengers. Again, there's going to be some variation, but it would be something that would make more sense for a class action. Mm-hmm. Whether that's how it turns out, um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it doesn't, you know, there's, they know exactly how many people were on the flight. So it's not like, um, oh, actually, it was 171 passengers. It was in wow. Alaska Airlines. Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. I do feel a little bit better about this, too, is because I have a little bit more faith. And I think what, it, what you said was the FAA. That well, does. federal federal aviation. Yeah, yeah uh, I, have a, I have a little bit more faith in the FAA doing kind of the due diligence here and making sure everything's safe. Because I'm assuming they're not just going through these Boeing's and seeing, oh, okay, is this one area that we know is a problem? You know, in other planes, they're probably going to go through and say, well, if there's this that problem that exists, there might be others, and they'll probably do an overlook over you know everything. So I, I I just think the FAA will be a little bit more strict, have better oversight, and and um, I don't know, make well, sure hopefully. this doesn't happen. Hopefully, because I feel like you, the last thing that you need is planes falling out of the sky, <laughs> right? Like that would not only be catastrophic for like the company, mm-hmm. but it would be catastrophic for just the overall economy and, and society. If you, if people didn't feel safe going from one location to the next, like that is a very integral part of, yeah, uh, of yeah. our society. Yeah. Yeah. That's a scary thing. Mm-hmm. Um, int- what other interesting cases do you have? Okay. I know you're going to like this one. <laughs> Zombie deer disease. Zombie deer disease. Okay, I've been preparing for this. You have, have you? <laughs> I have. I have my game plan set up. How, what, what stage are we at in the, in the infestation so far? All right, so there's this zombie deer disease, and it is affecting deer, elk, and moose, and where it's only been found at this point um, in the state of Wyoming. Okay. And what it is, they call it zombie deer disease because of how the animals appear. 
Um, but what it actually is, is it's a, it's a condition called chronic wasting disease. But when um, an animal has this disease, they are left drooling, lethargic, stumbling, and with a blank stare. Okay. Hence the name zombie. Well, so they're not feral. It's not like a rabies type <laughs> situation where they're actively trying to infect others. No, and they're they're not like attacking or trying to kill yeah. anybody, but okay. they're just looking zombie-like, kind of staggering around, drooling with blank stare. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have tested about 800 of them, and they've found this disease. And the concern is that it could spread to humans. Now, to uh, there's no indication that it has at this time yeah. but you know it kind of it, it goes back to the mad cow disease cow disease back in the 1980s and 90s and I know you weren't really around for that. I don't know if you've heard well, about it at all. I came in around 98. So. Well, I'm, I'm well aware where you came <laughs> in, but you might have heard about things that happened before. The mad cow disease <laughs> does sound familiar. What, what, what was the situation there? So that was a similar disease, not exactly the same, but there were a lot, and it started in England, and there were a lot of cows that had this disease kind of with some of the same symptoms. But what happened in this situation was that it was the first time that they had um, this disease in animals, and then people who... It, 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 it um, basically was transferred to humans through consuming the meat of the cows. Wow. Yeah. And so that's the concern is it's not exactly the same disease, but it's similar enough. You know, can this happen? Can humans get this uh, chronic wasting yeah. disease, this zombie deer disease? Um, and at this point, it hasn't happened yet, but they're keeping a close look out um, and warning about it and, um, and and recommending that you not eat the meat of these you know, deer and elk. Um, I mean, we don't eat a lot of that, but there are a lot of people who are yeah. hunters or who... A lot of parts of the country, that's pretty common. Yeah, absolutely. And like right now, they've they've found it only in Wyoming, but we don't know where else this this, this may be present. Mm-hmm. And so is this something that's brand new? Like a, this is an unknown disease and they're fully now discovering that it exists and now concerned that it might go to humans. Well, yes and no. It's 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 in a class of diseases and and uh, the mad cow disease is another one and then um, a third one is called um Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. So there, and actually that's one that, that humans specifically have it affects the nervous system, but it's a whole um, family of diseases. Oh boy, and and the category, I don't know if I'll be able to it's transmissible, spongiform Encephal, encephalopathies. Okay. So TSEs. Wow. So it's this category of, you know, horrible diseases that basically eat away your brain, I guess, yeah. in layman's terms. Um, uh, and so mad cow disease is one and this chronic wasting disease is another. And then this uh, CJD, the Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. And again, they're similar enough um, that it looks like they, it, it could be something that would be transferred to humans. Mm-hmm. And the concern is that this, this could, um, you know, be a real outbreak and a, and a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That would be terrifying. I mean, blank stare drooling, that's like Saturday morning after a night of drinking for me, but <laughs> <laughs> for that to be permanent, I can only So, so Christina might have to check you periodically. Exactly. Uh, she might be calling me up saying, I think Ben might have a exactly. uh, zombie deer disease. Well, I wonder too, with situations like this, where, uh, for example, with like mad cow disease, it was transferable to humans that ate the meat. But once yeah. it went into one human, you know, people aren't eating each other, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, then, Unless they crash in the Andes. Yeah, then it, there's no risk of it going to anyone else, like human to human uh, transfer. Right. Because yeah. I think that's where things get, okay, you know, we're, we're kind of fucked here. <laughs> this, this <laughs> I mean, unless, bad. This, unless the humans become zombies, and then do zombies eat, eat the humans or just kill them? Oh, they do. Well, well, I don't know. How are, how are zombies going to, you know, just substance? They need substance. And they See, need, I'm not, I'm just not a zombie expert. Yeah, and that was, yeah, yeah. I know that I have a zombie expert sitting here across the table from yeah. me, so I'm relieved about that. But I guess yeah. the zombies do eat humans. And so... Have you not watched Walking Dead or any Walking any Dead. scary movies in the last 15, 20 years <laughs> that are zombie related? Actually, I think the last zombie movies I watched were Night of the Living Dead, which were like back in like, I don't know what, the 70s yeah. and 80s or something like that. Yeah, well, I, I would be more frustrated, but it's okay because you have me here. And if, <laughs> if anything did happen, then, you know, I would be able to, to educate you and, and everyone else on kind of what the next steps were, how yeah. we can um, how survive as a society. A zombie apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, zombie deer disease. I was really hoping there would be con- some kind of feral action, running around, running into cars, like some real chaos going down compared to just kind of like boringly just sitting there with a blank look. Well, I mean, if they're staggering around drooling, with, and I mean, they could easily be staggering into roads and that sort of thing. I don't think that they're particularly aggressive. Yeah. I think, you know, the thing is that, that I, and again, I'm not a hunter, so so maybe hunters can get can clue me in on some of this. But, I mean, if you're out there and you're shooting elk and deer, mm-hmm. I mean, how close do you get to them? Do you look in their eyes and <laughs> see, see if it's a blank stare? Or if yeah. it's, um, do you, I mean, and, and then once you shoot them. Um, Is there any other signs? Of- I, yeah, I mean, would you necessarily know that, that you know, this carcass had, had it or not? And I'm not real clear on that from what I could see. Um, other than, you know, they were, were, you know, if you took them in for testing. But if you just shot the thing and brought it home and put it in your freezer i mean how do you i don't know know. yeah i mean that's probably something that they're gonna was there anything with the mad cow disease that they could easily tell with the cows well cows are a little bit different because you're not out hunting them in the wild and so generally people are you know there's like the whole big big uh you know factories where they're killing them and so they're looking at them and they're seeing that they are looking mad (laughs) they're not looking like the you know happy cow you know prancing along to its death it's looking and 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 they were and actually those mad cows were like mad i mean they were not so much zombie um yeah they yeah they were were acting aggressive and crazy so um so 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 you could but but again it's like a more controlled environment Mm -hmm. um and i don't think there's any like big big deer and elk processing plants but i could be completely wrong on that i really I mean i'm know. sure there there are out there some well actually yeah, i don't well i'm sure there are because if there is like i you can go to whole foods or sprouts and get deer and elk meat i'm sure like you don't have to go to a butcher in order for there to be suppliers for that i would imagine there has to be some type of reliable source of deer and elk other than them just yeah. sending out an army of hunters every well, but, just, but, it, but but i mean it's not like i mean have you ever ever heard of like you know some elk farm where they're like actually breeding them or See, that's the intention farm? they don't want you to know <laughs> not, right now the cows know. and the chicken farms are getting all the heat for uh, you know and you think that the deer and elk is all fine exactly well i, I don't mean, know i mean it, maybe there is i just i've never heard about that um and part of and you know part of the, the reason why people like to eat venison and all of this is because it is it's it's wild meat and it's not you know raised in some situation where it's being fed you know this corn and all of the the yeah. uh you know fructose well all, all of the the crap that makes the, the, our meats so unhealthy you know whereas like say grass-fed beef or you know or wild you know i mean and even cage-free chicken all of these things mm-hmm. um and that's supposed to be like the big plus about you know venison the deer and elk is that they're not farmed. Yeah. They're they're wild, and so their meat is leaner, and they're just not you know fattened up for the kill. It makes sense. Also, the cage free chicken thing is like such a scam. <laughs> honestly, I mean, it's compared to small cages, yeah, but then they're just thrown into massive cages of overpopulation. Like they're body to body in there, and there's just no. There's, I don't think there's really many good farms out there. But anyways, that's a separate point. Hopefully the zombies' deer disease doesn't escalate. Um, if it does, then we'll be prepared. I'll be coming here. We'll be uh, hunkering <laughs> well, we'll down. We'll probably be heading down to Sonoida and hunkering yeah, down, going off the grid or something. But, yeah. but yeah, so this is, you know, again, it's not, it's not, we don't know that any, any humans have, have uh, contracted it yet. But if you are somebody who hunts, um, especially if you're in the vicinity of Wyoming, something to um, learn a little bit more about, research, um, you know, and there's probably a way to test for it if you are a hunter. Um, I, but, um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head what that would be, but just keep it, you know, keep an be, eye be careful. Be, and if, and if, a zoo, if a deer looks zombie-like, definitely don't eat it. Yeah, kill it, but don't eat it. <laughs> so no other hunters eat it. Um, any other interesting cases for us? We are kind of coming to it to an end here. Oh wow, we are. Okay. Um, well, maybe just one uh, one quick one, and then we'll get into. Uh, we wanted to start addressing some frequently asked questions. Um, so in one of the, you know, this this just this I was going to talk about last week, but we ran out of time. But I just thought it was really interesting because um, you know they're keeping track of um, how many women attorneys, you know, what the the percentages are of female attorneys and. Um, um, for the first time, women associates in law firms um, have reached 
the 50% mark. So wow. and actually gone over it. 50.3% um, of attorneys, of associate attorneys, are women at this point. Oh, Jesus, we're at 50.3. We've got to take that down to 50-50. We need complete <laughs> equal balance. Okay, here. now just wait up, wait up. So that's women associates, right? So those are yeah. the lower level positions. Yeah. Um, and if you look at associates of color, male and female combined, it's only at 30%. Okay. And right, so that then now colored females, then is that what you're saying? Combined? No, no. Uh, so associates of color, so non white associates, okay. uh, male and female, is still only at 30%. Uh, okay. So there's still a lot of in- inequity as far as, um, as, as, as attorneys of color go. Yeah. Um, and overall, lawyers of color, uh, is for associates and partners, is 20%. So, you know, pretty low. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so when you and again that's these are these are you know the entry level um, up to partner um, positions. Mm-hmm. When you look at you know who who are the partners, who are the leaders, who are the big earners. So at the partnership level, women are now at twenty seven percent. So again, still you know significantly lower than I mean you know less than a third yeah. of women are in that position. And if you look at black and Latina women, um, black women, 1%, Latina women, 1% in, in these leadership roles. Oh. So, um, you know, we're far from, um, you know, seeing yeah. equality in the legal industry still today in 2020. Well, this, th- these stats are from the end of 2023. So in, in a situation like this, and especially in, in the field of law where there's a lot of education and a lot of, you know, it's a long process to become a lawyer, um, is it realistic for there to be kind of an equilibrium where there is an even amount of, of genders and races across the board in all these areas? Because I would imagine that there's probably discrepancies down to like law school, for example, right? There's, there's maybe a lot more uh, white males in law school um, compared to, to, you know, the rest of the demographic. Um, and, and I would imagine that has something to do with the uh, discrepancies up there as well when it comes to... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that there's issues. I mean, when you go, you, you can go back to elementary school where women are directed in one, or little girls are directed in one direction yeah. and little boys are directed in another direction. Um, so there's, uh, you know, all sorts, uh, you know, at, at every stage there has been discrimination in the past. But I mean, it's been so many years that um, it's been illegal to discriminate. Um, and there have been programs to encourage women to enter into these areas. I mean, you know, we always talk about that, like in the STEM programs as well. Um, law has been one of one of those where, um, it, you know, it took a while for women. I mean, it wasn't a traditional female kind of job. Yeah. Um, you know, and in fact, um, the law school I went to, NYU, was the very first law school in the country to admit women. Wow. Um, but then I don't remember the exact date. I probably should know that. But I mean, you know, it's been <laughs> it's been a, whole, a heck of a lot of years. Yeah. Um, but but again. And, you know, um, even what, in fact, I, what was the story? Um, oh gosh, there's been a couple of movies Well, Sandra Day O'Connor, I think. Um, and then also, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the movie about her, I think she was actually told, um, she got admitted to Harvard law school and she was told, you know, you should go home and not take a, a, a spot that a man who has to support his family could have. I mean, Sandra Day O'Connor, same kind of situation. Um, you know, it's, it's, so that, those were the really obvious times, but it's been more subtle, but apparently, you know, it's still going on to, to some extent, um, and, and, it, and it, of course, it takes a while to catch up. But even when you get out of law school and you go to a job, I mean, I mean, I've told you stories about, you know, my first job um, and how differently I was treated as a woman, especially yeah. in the area of litigation. Yeah. Um, and so, so you know, uh, things are improving. I was a little bit shocked at the numbers because I would have thought we would have been at the 50 percent mark um, sooner. Uh, I guess I'm not totally surprised that we're not at the 50% mark when it comes to partners. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that goes into a lot of other issues, too, because to become partner, you have to be... But the associates, uh, it would be an associate. And, I, I mean, that was kind of what I was going to ask is that it, I, I agree with you that it does take time. And, and obviously, things have been getting better. There still are... Um, 
like there's definitely is discrimination and it's just being hid better now in these yeah. days, but it is going in the right direction. Um, but th- with things like this, where, where there is a lot of upward movement, it's not something that you can just get into the field and immediately have a partner position or have a CEO. You kind of need the culture to slowly change and you need that thing, that, that, that process to develop more. Um, and then slowly, but surely, you know, hopefully that equality goes up the, the chain. Well, definitely. And I think one of the issues, too, with when you go from associate to partner, you have to put in a certain number of years. And there's always been an issue if, if women decide to have children, yeah. you know, how much time can you take off? And and that's always been, a you know, that, that you're not on partnership track if you're on the mommy track. Yeah. You know, I mean, you back in the day, you pretty much had to choose or you stepped out. If you stepped out for a couple of years, you're off track again. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's been a, a big, a big area. Um, I know a lot of firms now are providing um, paternity leave as well. So, you know, men and women, when they have children, have equal rights to time off. And there's been a push to um, to Mm -hmm. not have that affect your ability to become partner. Yeah. Um, yeah, It's a long long process. Long process. Uh, It's interesting, too, that you mentioned that it is men and women with the paternity leave, uh, because that was, you know, with the partners and with this becoming, you know, very high uh, ranking roles in a lot of these companies, it is a very large time commitment. Um, and I think like the absurdity of, of there being two different tracks, like the mommy track or the partner track, like, I don't think that's fair at all. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, th- <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't want to come off as, as some, some anti-feminist here, but I think that there is a balance between, um, you know, making sure that women have the same opportunities and then at the same time men, right? Because there are a lot of single fathers out there and there are a lot of people that um, do, you know, have outside requirements, to expectations on them, whatever it may be. But that quality kind of needs to go hand in hand both ways at the same time. Well, I agree. I don't think that's anti-feminist at all. I mean, I think, and I think that the reality is that um, most women would like for, you know, their partner, be it male or female, to be willing to take equal time off from their careers Mm. and put in equal time in the child rearing. Um, I mean, that, that would be the ideal that both partners have that opportunity and don't risk their careers so that, you know, truly everybody can have it all. You can be a good parent and you can uh, be very successful in your career in law or elsewhere. Yeah. Well, it's good that it's going in the right direction. Uh, Hopefully, you know, it just keeps on going that way. Um, We are kind of at the end here. Do you want to to go over the questions? Sure, sure. So we wanted to start addressing some frequently asked questions. Um, And then this one won't take too long. But one of the questions was, you know, how do I know if it makes sense to file a lawsuit if my injury is severe enough? Um, And so a lot of people just don't even bother contacting an attorney because they think, well, maybe, you know, it sounds like a big project and a big ordeal. Do I really, you know, is it significant enough? Um, And, you know, and and the real answer to that is, you know, you should get in touch with an attorney and find out. And and, and certainly we'll tell you, um, I mean, I have many times had people come and have had, you know, situations, and a lot of times you see this in medical malpractice, you know, something goes wrong, but you weren't significantly injured by it. Um, you know, does it make sense to file a lawsuit? Well, you have to say, okay, what are the damages? If the damages, you know, are $500 of medical bills and a week of feeling uncomfortable, um, the reality is that you, well, you may well be able to get a settlement, but should you file a lawsuit? Well, probably not because the lawsuit's going to cost, depending on where you are, probably average of $400 to get it filed. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be other costs if you have to, I mean, God forbid you actually have to get all the way to trial, you know, there's there's thousands yeah. of dollars, um, tens of thousands, you know, depending on the type of case, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars um, that, that um, you know, are incurred to get to the trial. And so you have to make sure that your damages are more than the cost it's going to take to get there. Yeah, but I, I would say on the client end of things, like those aren't things that the client needs to worry about at all, because like every situation is completely unique. Like at the end of the day, if you're, if you're someone that is experiencing issues, if you feel like you've been done wrong, in some type of way, it's better to just reach out because exactly, while there yeah. is a lot of factors to consider, those are all factors that the attorney is going to be going through and they're going to be asking all these questions and they're going to be the one that that has all this knowledge and all of this experience to to give you the right guidance and, and direction. 
because every case is different, the damages in every case is different situation. Like there, there's just no, you know, playbook of like this is the right time to file a lawsuit and this right isn't the or right this time. is the right number. There's yeah. nothing like that. And the real and the other thing too is that, um, you know, that the, the the cost that I'm talking about would be like in say a superior court. But I mean, there are also you could there are. Um, uh, justice courts, there's small claims court, yeah. there are different ways um, and, and, and some routes that are very inexpensive and quick yeah. where, and, and you may not even need an attorney to pursue the case. So oftentimes, you know, when, when I'll be speaking with someone, I may tell them this isn't something that it makes sense for you to hire me to do, but here's what you can do. Yeah. And here's how you can pursue this um, and, and potentially get, um, you know, the recovery that you're entitled to that just mm-hmm. isn't hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, I can. I think this is a great question because I, I can imagine it being a very overwhelming experience and kind of just frustrating too, right? Like you don't ha- feel like you have all the information necessary. You don't know what to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we always talk about this. It's better to call. It's better just oh, to yeah, check in yeah. and see. And, and uh, there's, there's no cost associated, right? That like you, people can call and they can ask questions and we're more than happy to give feedback, but all attorneys are, right? Like if people in personal injury specifically, everyone is going to hear you out and listen to your case and let you know and hopefully give you you know good advice i can't speak for every attorney right. in the country but you know more often than not right and, you know and that's the thing too is people still will ask you know well, what does it cost for a consultation and in this area of law it doesn't cost anything yeah. i mean there's i mean pretty much everybody will will give you a free consultation or at least speak with you on the phone um if somebody is going to charge you you know that, that, that's questionable right then and there but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but generally speaking um an, an attorney in this area is going to uh give you their best advice as to whether it's something that they can pursue. If not, they should explain to you why and what your other alternatives are. I think that was a great breakdown. If anyone does have any other questions or comments, feel free to let us know. You can throw it down in the comment section wherever you're watching this, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, wherever. You can throw us a DM as well. Or if you don't want to keep things a little bit more private, stay anonymous, we completely understand. You can also reach out over email at podcast at showerlaw.com. Whatever your question, concern may be, we're happy to answer. I think we love talking about these types of stuff (laughs) on, uh, on, on the podcast. Definitely gives us some new and interesting perspectives on things as well well um thank you again for everyone tuning in and we'll see you next week prioritizing profits prioritizing prioritizing dangerous drug and product cases